For me, the most impressive moments of No Man's Sky were spent exploring the galaxy map. It's a macro-scale model of all the game's potential, a place where the astronomical proportions of its space were fully realized and executed. It may be the one part of the game where you can sit back and say, wow, those crazy bastards actually went and did it. The best two hours of No Man's Sky are its first two hours, starting with you being stranded on a planet gathering resources to repair your damaged spaceship. Then you move to an adjacent planet of the same star system, gathering resources to this time build a hyperdrive to visit another star system. And then at some point you press the map button, you zoom way the hell out, and learn just how microscopically small your experience is. There are 18 quintillion planets just as unique as the ones you start on. It's a game world so big that it takes 43 minutes just to scroll from one side of this map to the other. And beyond the galaxy's edge, there is absolutely nothing. But the most disturbing thing about No Man's Sky isn't the infinite black void beyond its borders. Instead, it's the void that's inside of them. No Man's Sky is the existential crisis of an overhyped community. Its marketing flaunted missing features and inaccurate trailers, which combined with the implications of procedurally generating an entire universe, has led to No Man's Sky being one of the most controversial releases of the year. It's garnered such a huge amount of negativity and mockery that scrolling through any discussion of the game is much more miserable than playing it. And I say that despite thinking that No Man's Sky isn't that great of a game. Can you run into other people, other players on the game? Yes, but the chances of that are incredibly rare, just because of the size of what we're building. I only watched the launch trailer. Beyond that, the only news stories I followed were the offices flooding, the Colbert appearance, and then the delays in May. And even just on those terms, without being fully aware of what I was apparently missing, it was not an elegant experience. A troublesome UI, conflicting goals and tones, a lack of content and diversity despite its size, and a host of technical issues show the telltale signs of two disasters. A small, troubled team biting off far more than they can chew, and that same team being rushed to deadlines before completion. But explaining why requires tackling the infamous question of, What do you do in No Man's Sky? Which really, really isn't that hard to answer. You explore to gather up the resources you need to fuel a flight to the finish line. In that respect, it's actually less freeform and open than the standard of other adventure sandboxes I'm used to. Sid Meier's Pirates, Mountain Blade, and Freelancer are games that face a lot of the same purposelessness, but had sandbox worlds with a whole lot more activities to do than in No Man's Sky, despite them having so much less space. This is an example of why quality is so much more important than quantity. Out of all 18 quintillion of those planets, you'll find them populated by a remarkably small pool of designed gameplay encounters. The three alien races, their respective monuments, infested shelters, and abandoned factories, basically anything that can host all the creative potential of a text box, just functions as a glorified vending machine. You get asked an easy question before they spit out some kind of disposable snack. And that's not just technical and creative bankruptcies failing to make interesting events happen. This is also a result of the game's balance not really being balanced. You're very frequently rewarded with weapon and suit upgrade recipes that are expensive to craft but rarely needed because just nothing on the ground ever seems truly threatening enough to warrant the upgrade. On the other hand, saving up for a new ship was nearly a necessity for me. First of all, because inventory space is startlingly small despite all the collecting the game wants you to do, and secondly, because the early space battles were borderline unwinnable without a few of those awfully expensive upgrades. If you get news of space pirates flying your way and you're still rocking the starter ship, you might as well just turn around and go back home. Because they don't follow you to planet surfaces. As you progress, you'll squeeze inventory space and save money on your way to check into the way stations of two main story branches, both of which have you doing a lot of jumps for not a lot of reward. Fuel ingredients will take up the bulk of your scant few inventory slots, which will also be occupied by an increasing amount of quest items and, strangely, player upgrades as you go. Meanwhile, you still need to free up multiple inventory spaces for the crafting process to make more fuel in the first place. The journey through No Man's Sky is tedious, it's long, and it requires a lot of stuffy micromanagement along the way. And its small pool of gameplay encounters means it's repetitive, too. Pay attention to all those systems and you'll notice all sorts of design decisions that just don't make sense. 
Like how you're rewarded for more fuel-efficient takeoff costs by landing on a landing pad. Cool! Neato! That makes me want to pay attention to where I'm landing. But when flying, I have no way to look down to see where I'm going to land, so paying attention to where I'm landing is almost impossible. Speaking of looking around the cockpit, why can't I look around the cockpit to see who's shooting me in outer space? Which set of these statistics is for the gun I'm buying versus the one I already have? Why do I have to dedicate two inventory slots to upgrading an item that only takes one inventory slot? I mean, I, I get that they ended up having to compromise on a lot of the space illusion to make the game easier, like how outer space is packed to the brim with rocks that fizzle in and out of a radius around the player to drop rocket fuel, and how all the planets are incredibly close together, they're kind of uncomfortably close together, and how lifeless planets still have these mushrooms all over them to give the player an easy source of carbon, but there's one bit of flavor text that it's a little too patronizing for me not to call out here. The game tells you you're discovering all these plants and animals all by yourself when you're on a planet that's already been explored by other aliens. But I know the rebuttal I'm gonna get here. My playstyle has me chasing after high numbers for high rewards, and that's just gonna prompt the response that No Man's Sky can actually be a very, very chill game. You can just stop to take a long, quiet walk along the space beach to smell the space roses, in which case I genuinely feel like the thing I'm playing is just something completely different from what everyone else is playing. On top of its generation procedures, rarely ever creating something pretty enough to justify the soundtrack in the handmade areas, which are both very nice, the core gameplay of No Man's Sky is just... It's not Journey. It's not Abzu. Its underlying gameplay loop is very heavy on the numbers of its resource management, and the UI certainly lets you know that. It's no surprise that the first wave of mods aims to turn a lot of that stuff off. Walking around an alien planet decreases your life support and hazard protection meters, which require a constant drip feed of isotopes to refill, which means you always have to worry about running out of something. The nagging UI prompts, voice prompts, and waypoint markers sliding all over the place don't really give the vibe that this is a game to mellow out to, even though the demands it does ask of you aren't too mentally taxing. They are stressful and frustrating, but just enough so to always give you something to do, some resource to refill on your way to the next star jump. And in that respect, No Man's Sky does succeed in at least being a compelling activity. You can zone out and just follow icons in the same way here as you do with the busy work gameplay of modern Far Cries, sprinting from flower to mineral to alien creature to slowly fill meters that promise to eventually get you somewhere interesting. But really, it just iterates and improves on established genre norms in only two areas, both of which are just kind of technical milestones rather than artistic ones. The first is the sweet, sweet scale of that galaxy map, and the second is that it does make a playable transition from a planet's surface all the way up to outer space. It might not be a fully realized game layer applied on top of Space Engine, but it's a solid step on the way there. What we have for now, though, works as an addictive and efficient time waster, but it's really kind of mindless. I had the most fun with it while my brain was planted halfway elsewhere. I genuinely enjoyed the game on two nights. One, when I was streaming it, and two, when I was playing with a chat room full of friends in the background. But when I was by myself, just playing it within my own head, things got kinda weird. The fantasy of becoming an enlightened, knowledge-hungry space explorer turned into a rat race. And that, that was what was truly scary. All the extraordinary alien life in the procedural planet-side vistas became mundane. Visiting them turned into an annoyance. The galaxy gradually became a box, its possibility space shrinking the further I explored it. The infinite scale of the universe became, paradoxically, a very limiting factor. After all, playing longer and exploring further only increases the chances of eventually finding duplicates. By the same processes of so many other games, my space explorer turned into a jaded space asshole. My humanity gradually leaving as I turned into some kind of post-human amorphous intelligence cloud. As the limits of space, time, and resources eventually became meaningless, I had less of a reason to care about the universe. The miracle of life, skies, sunsets, and sceneries, and pretty much everything just turned into numbers. As my journey winded its way to closure, I found myself only stopping to fill up on gas. And I wonder if that was the intention or not.